This video will demonstrate how to use our deterministic model of a simple standing long jump to evaluate the performance of a novice athlete. Here's a reminder of the deterministic model that we developed in our last video. And from this model, we made a manageable list of factors to consider that can help evaluate a performance. First, we need to observe a novice performer and get a sequence of images or videos to compare. Then we can go through each factor of our deterministic model and describe how this novice could improve. There are two obvious ways the position shown here could be modified to increase takeoff distance. The arms could be swung forward and up so that they would be horizontal and forward of the shoulders at takeoff, and the extension of the hip, knee, and ankle joints could be increased. These two factors can be seen when comparing the novice image to the expert performer. When looking at the force of the shoulders, we know that the velocity at takeoff, and therefore the flight distance, could be increased if he strongly contracted his shoulder flexors at the proper time, and thereby exert the forces across the shoulder joint that are needed to swing his arms vigorously forward and upwards into the takeoff. The performance might have also been improved if the performer had not swung his arms so vigorously forward and upward at the outset. This appears to have led to an unweighting of the feet at position B and a momentary loss of balance that caused shifting of the feet at position C. The rest of the takeoff was then performed with the feet separated in a forward and backwards direction. Now let's look at the forces of the hips, knees, and ankles. The velocity of takeoff may have been increased if the hips were extended more forcefully and completely prior to takeoff. The observation made with respect to the forces across the hip joint appear to apply equally well to those across the knee joints. The same might also be said with respect to the forces across the ankle joints. Now looking at the time forces start, the performer should swing their arms first and then jump forward and upwards. This is referred to as swing then spring. Now it's difficult to tell whether the performer's failure to fully extend his hips, knees, and ankle joints prior to takeoff was due to less than maximal force exerted across these joints, poor timing, or ending the application of the forces too soon. So these are types of questions that we should consider while we're creating an evaluation of the performance. Now looking at landing position, we can create a list of characteristics that we would look for in the ideal performance. First, the performer can maximize the flight distance by delaying the landing. The flight distance could be improved if the performer's center of gravity were lower than it is at the instant of landing. The performer could also maximize the landing distance by assuming a body position with the heels well forward of the center of gravity. The landing distance could be improved if the hips were more flexed and the knees were more extended at the same instance. The performer could also minimize the fallback distance by not touching the ground behind the point at which the rearmost heel lands. Because his fallback distance is already zero, no improvement is possible there. After analyzing the performance, we can now make a list of all the possible improvements to the performance. But before correcting the errors, we need to determine if there are any faults that are a potential result of other faults. And the answer is yes, at least one. The lack of arm swing can be related to inappropriate position of the arms or incomplete extension of the hips, knees, and ankles. So we can reevaluate these after arm swing has been corrected. We now have a final list of errors that we can address with corrections. This includes decreasing the vigor of the initial arm swing. This may improve balance at takeoff and the ability to swing the arms properly. Extend the hips, knees, and ankles more forcefully. Now this is important, but not necessarily the first thing to do. Swing the arms forward and up, and start forward and upward swing of the arms before the legs. Now this requires timing and can be difficult. So you can first introduce the swing and then work on timing. However, there are still many other faults that we could address, but trying to address them all at once could be overwhelming and possibly create more errors, so you need to establish a priority. This requires you to set up guidelines for deciding what makes a fault important. Keep in mind that you usually want to make the biggest improvement in the available or shortest time. Use knowledge of physical and psychological characteristics of the performer in conjunction with the nature of the faults. So after prioritizing, here's our final list. Our last and very important goal is to find a way to introduce the corrections. This will not be covered in detail, but there are some important considerations. 
when do you introduce each correction, how do you instruct the performer, and what type of practice do you use to correct the errors? All of these questions are best considered with respects to motor learning, but they will not be covered here.